Introducing motivational keynote speaker Marilyn Sherman, who helps companies increase their profits by inspiring people to get out of their comfort zone and live life in the front row. Watch how Marilyn inspires people to stop complaining and have more success at work and in life. With a message of hope and encouragement, Marilyn Sherman. I believe life is a big venue, and we have choices as to where we sit in our life. We can sit in the balcony, which balcony seats are not very good. And oftentimes when you're in the balcony, it's view obstructed, it's, it's, it's just not the best seat in the house. Or we can sit in general admission. General admission is not bad. It's not great, but it's not bad. I wrote a book on how to get out of your comfort zone. So to me, people that live life in general admission are people that are stuck in a comfort zone. And then we could live in the front row. And that to me is where life is lived. Living in the front row of life is where you get to say every day, man, it doesn't get any better than this. And being in the front row of your life doesn't necessarily literally mean being in the front row, but it just means for you, what does your front row look like for you? And I asked a couple of people what their favorite front row seat moments were, and, and it varies. And Richard Shelp, my ambassador, um, his favorite front row seat was taking his son when he was a lot younger to an NBA basketball game and to see his son stand next to Yao Ming, this huge basketball player from China, he said that was one of his front row seat experiences in his life. Now, for you, basketball may be like no big deal. Holly Catchpole, <laughs> sitting in the front row. Um, she said her front row recently just happened when her daughter performed at Carnegie Hall. Isn't that great? So what I like to do is inspire people to get out of their comfort zone and live life in the front row. Now, why am I so passionate about helping people live life in the front row? It's because I had a balcony experience when I was very young and I vowed that one day I would inspire people to never have that kind of feeling again. It was when I was 13 years old. Can any of you remember when you were 13? Did anybody have a crush on someone else in their class? Anybody else besides me? Okay. I had a crush on the best looking guy in our class. And um, to give you a little bit of background on me, um, I was bigger than all the girls in my class and all the boys in my class. <laughs> and my nickname was Moose. Seriously, so I did not get a lot of play with the guys. <laughs> Until one day, my crush came up to me, not all my cute little girlfriends, came up to me and asked me to go meet him behind Island Park Elementary School to make out with him. <laughs> I was very excited. Uh, until he said there was a catch. He wanted me to meet him there at midnight. I'm thinking, I am a 13-year-old girl. He is asking me to sneak out of my house in the middle of the night to go to Island Park Elementary School just to make out with him? <laughs> I am so there. <laughs> so I did, and for five minutes I was on top of the world, and then we were done. And he said something to me in that moment that I'll never forget. He looked at me and he said, don't tell anyone. And I felt like I, was, I wasn't even worthy to be seen in public with. That's how horrible I felt. That to me is a balcony seat. So I want to inspire people to never feel like that again, to, to get out of your comfort zone and get a front row seat in life. So I've got four strategies to help you get a front row seat in your life. The first one is to have a vision. Where do you see yourself? What is your front row seat? What does it look like to you? Have that vision for yourself. And also, connect with and surround yourself with other people who will support you in your vision, or at least support you in your enthusiasm for your vision. I had a boss one time who did not have a vision and did not support me in my vision to one day be a motivational speaker. I was working in training and development and human resources to establish credibility to one day fulfill my vision of becoming a motivational speaker. And so I had a flyer that came across my desk advertising a big motivational rally with Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy, and Debbie Fields, and you, you probably booked these speakers for this event. Um, and I went to my boss and I said, can I go to this event? I had been listening to their audio cassette tapes and all their, read all their books, so I was so excited to see all these speakers live and in person for the first time. This is back in 1991. And I went to my boss and I said, can I go to this event? And he said, no. I said, it's only $99. How about if I pay for it myself? Um, you give me the day off to go and I'll go to Philly, learn everything I can and come back to the department, teach everybody what I learned. And he said, no. I said, how about if I pay for it myself and um, take a vacation day and go and learn everything I can and come back and teach everybody in the department what I learned? And that's when he said, I really don't care what you do when you go on your vacation. 
I said, okay, thanks for your support. Drove to Philadelphia, 10,000 people at this event. And I'm sitting right up front because that's where life is lived. But I'm really getting a, a lot of content from all the speakers, but also watching how they work the crowd. And I was watching the masters at work because one day I had a vision of being like them on stage. Not like them, but like Marilyn on stage. So um, Brian Tracy was a closing keynote speaker and literally hundreds of people rushed the stage to shake his hand, sort of like what you will do in about 14 minutes from now. <laughs> I'm positively projecting my outcome. So when I was watching him work the crowd, and he would literally look people in the eye and for about two and a half seconds, shake their hand and pull them through the line because he had a lot of people to meet. And after eight or nine hands, he would switch and work this side of the room. And I thought, wow, he's really good. He's not ignoring anybody. He's connecting with his people. And then it hit me. I only have two and a half seconds with Brian Tracy. What am I possibly going to say to him in two and a half seconds to let him know that I am not like all these other people? I am different. I have a vision. So I went up to him, and right before I went to shake his hand, I took a deep breath, and I said, Mr. Tracy, my boss wouldn't support me coming here today, so I took a vacation day, paid for myself just to come and hear you speak. And it worked. He didn't shake my hand. He gave me a hug. And when he hugged me, he said, was it worth it? <laughs> I said, yes. So now I'm driving down the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Brian Tracy hugged me. Brian Tracy hugged me. I'm so excited. Brian Tracy hugged me. I ran upstairs and I told my husband that story. Brian Tracy hugged me. And guess what he said? Worse. He said he was probably just trying to get you to buy more tapes. I went from scraping the ceiling high to feeling about this big with that one comment. So I divorced him. <laughs> It's like, why would I be married to someone who doesn't support me in my vision? <laughs> now, for those of you who I've offended because I divorced him, I don't think I'm alone. Anybody here besides me have a starter marriage in their past? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. So the first one is to have a vision and surround yourself with people who support you in your vision. The second strategy, never underestimate the power of acknowledgement. Let people know they've made a difference for you in their life. Let people know how much you appreciate them and that you want to thank them for what they've done for you. Let people know that they've inspired you. The power of acknowledgement can change lives. It changed my life. I did one time I acknowledged somebody and it literally changed the course of my life forever. I was in San Diego where my speaking people, woohoo. Um, I was in San Diego and I had been single for seven years and I thought, you know what, it's time uh, for Moose to get a man. So. Um, <laughs> And I, and I deserved a front row man in my life, so I decided to practice what I preach. When I speak, I talk a lot about goal setting, so I practice what I preach. I made a list of all the traits I wanted in a man. Came up with 356 traits on my list. <laughs> and in the top 10, he had to speak fluent French. Why not? It's my list. So I'm at this event. I w invested in my business, I go to this event, and um, it was a small business retreat, and in walks this guy, and he has this French accent, he talks like this, and I'm thinking, oh. <laughs> and the whole weekend I kept hearing this French accent, and I, j I got so excited, I made a decision. And what are you like when you make a decision? You're on fire, right? So I made a decision. I am not going to wait for some man to come into my life to speak French. I'm going to go take a French class. So at the end of this retreat, I went and found him in the parking lot as he was leaving. And I said, excuse me, I just, I just want to acknowledge you. You have no idea how much you, you've made a difference for me. Just by meeting you and hearing you all weekend long, I decided to take a French class. So I just want to thank you. And I swear, that was my only intention. Much to my delight, he said, you do not need to take a French class. I can help you with your French. And so he took me out to dinner, and I took notes. And he took me out to dinner the next night, and I took less notes. <laughs> and then I married him. <laughs> I never would have seen him again had I not taken the time to acknowledge him. So don't ever underestimate the power of acknowledgement. The third strategy is to take your job very seriously. There are parts of your job that you don't like. Take it seriously. When you say you're going to do something, do it. When you make a commitment, make, make a promise, even the stuff you don't want to do and don't like to do, take it seriously. And I learned that lesson from a second grader. This little boy is named Lin Howe. 
Lin Howe, I found out about him from the Summer Olympics. I'm so excited that we have an Olympian speaking today. But the Summer Olympics in Beijing, China. I was watching the opening ceremonies. And whenever you watch the opening ceremonies of any Olympic Games, they always have all the countries come in in alphabetical order with the host country coming in last. And every country represented has one athlete that is de the designated flag bearer, right? So for Beijing, China, Richard, you'll appreciate this. Who do you think was the flag bearer? This guy right here, Yao Ming. So he, the millions of the people in the world, around the world watching the opening ceremonies are watching Yao Ming walk into the stadium, but he was not alone. He was holding the hand, he was next to this little boy, Lin Hao. Millions of people seeing this little second grader. Now why, why did he have the honor of walking in the opening ceremonies? Well, right before the Olympics, his elementary school was the epicenter of an earthquake and he got out alive. And as soon as he got out alive, he went back in, found a classmate that was unconscious, picked him up, literally carried him to safety. And after he did that, he went back in and he did it again. He saved two of his classmates and then he gathered all the children around, led them in song and in prayer to keep them calm until all the adults came and rescued them. Now, when the media got a hold of this, they said, well, why did you do it? Why did you go back into your building? This little second grader said, it was my job. I am the hall monitor. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? He did not uh, wait for a committee, <laughs> wait for a vote, <laughs> delegate it. Uh, he just took his job very seriously. So if he can take his job seriously, you and I can too. Now, what if you have parts of your job that you just can't stand and you all represent speakers? What's the number one complaint that speakers have about their job? They hate to what? They hate to travel. Well, if you hate something about your job, I suggest just change your perspective. I think that's what my role is in life, not to really be a motivational speaker, but to change people's perspective about life. And I was flying from Las Vegas, where I live, to Atlanta with a layover in Dallas. And my client was picking me up for dinner as soon as I arrived in Atlanta, so I wore my cute shoes and not my practical shoes. <laughs> Big mistake. Because when I landed at DFW, I had to walk to the new gate, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, my feet are killing me. And I was halfway to the connecting gate, and I realized I forgot my book in the seat pocket in front of me. And I'm thinking, oh no, it's not my book. It's a library book. It's a hardcover business book. How, what, what's the fine on a library book when you don't return it? So now I'm going all the way back to the first gate, praying that the, the plane is still there. And the gate agent was wonderful. She was boarding the plane and she said, let me go run on board and get it. So she comes back with my book. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy, I'm so happy. So I'm going to the new gate and my feet are killing me. And I go all the way to the connecting gate and I sit down thinking, man, my feet are killing me. And I forgot my purse. I'm like, oh my gosh, what is wrong with me? I had to go all the way back to the first gate and there's my purse just sitting there on the counter where I left it, totally unattended. I'm thinking, I am surrounded by angels. So I pick up my purse and I have my book. My feet are done. So I stop at a gift shop to buy a pair of those fuzzy socks. And I go and I sit down at the new gate, massaging my feet, starting to get irritated. Now, I'm not having a bad day because there's no such thing as bad days, only bad moments that people choose to nurse all day long. <laughs> so I'm not having a bad day, but I'm certainly having a bad moment. And then all of a sudden I looked up and in the 18 years that I have been speaking professionally and traveling around, this has never happened before. There are two gates worth of people standing up, all looking in the same direction out the window in only how I, what I could describe as um, an eerie silence. And I'm thinking, oh, what, what's going on? So I get up and I talk to the stranger and I say, excuse me, what's everybody looking at? And he said, well, look out the window. And I looked out the window and this is what I saw. American Airlines flight with a baggage cart with an American flag and all those crew member saluting the casket of a fallen soldier. I don't know who that soldier was. I don't know if it was a man or a woman. I don't know how they died, but I do know this. They died, they sacrificed their life for the freedom of my country. And in that moment, I moved to gratitude. I was so grateful for that soldier. And then it hit me. You cannot walk in gratitude and sit in self-pity at the same time. You cannot walk in gratitude and sit in anger or resentment 
at the same time. And my perspective shifted immediately. And my feet didn't hurt anymore. <laughs> Isn't that great? So um, find a way to have more gratitude so that when those things in your job that you know you have to take seriously, um, it's not so hard anymore. And then my final strategy is to take yourself lightly. We just need to lighten up. We need to find more humor in our everyday life because humor to me, well, you know this, humor is very therapeutic. Laughing hysterically releases endorphins in your brain and um, it's exponentially more powerful than morphine <laughs> and it's free <laughs> and legal <laughs> and you can <laughs> get these endorphins released anytime you laugh hysterically or work out or eat chocolate or have sex. Not all at the same time. <laughs> But it even works when you fake it. <laughs> and that is the laughing part. So when, really, you can literally laugh, fake laugh, and you still get endorphins released in your brain. So when someone says, hey, you want to go work out? <laughs> I don't need to. <laughs> so one of my goals is to laugh hysterically at least once a day. So I keep for myself what I call a humor file, and um, a couple of things in my humor file, I spoke in Alaska one time where I met a woman up there, and she said, there's so many men up here in Alaska that uh, the odds are really good. But I gotta warn you, I've lived here all my life, the goods are really odd. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day I walk in, and my audience, they're all men in my audience, so I'm thinking, ooh, the odds are good, the goods are odd. And I walk in, and I say, well, good morning, gentlemen. <laughs> and the butt on my blouse popped off. <laughs> I, now that's funny. So that, that's funny. Um, another one, um, I was speaking at the Women's Food Service Forum, great conference, um, national speakers is taking care of all those speakers, that conference is starting tomorrow. This will be my eighth year in a row speaking at this conference. And imagine 2,500, 3,000 women in one hotel. What do they do for the bathroom breaks? Well, this one particular hotel took over the men's room, but they didn't just take it over. I thought they got very creative about it. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that great? They had a sense of humor. Put ferns in the urinals, and I'm thinking, this is awesome. Anytime they want to water the plants, they just flush. <laughs> and then on my way um, to uh, the same conference that was held in Orlando, um, it was before the car service, um, I had to go get a cab, and I hate waiting in cab lines, and the line was so long, I went right to the front of the line and started asking if anybody was going to the same resort I was going to, if anybody wanted to share expenses. So I met a guy, and uh, he said, sure, I'm going to that same resort. Well, let's go together and share a cab. So on the way, he said, um, so, uh, what brings you to Orlando? I said, oh, I'm really excited. I'm going to speak at this really big women's conference. And he got so excited, he said, I love big women. <laughs> no, you don't understand. I'm going to speak at this really large women's conference. He's like, I love them large, baby. <laughs> so have a vision for yourself. Never underestimate the power of acknowledgement. Take your work very seriously. Take yourself lightly. And uh, I got to tell you, standing here in front of you on this day, is definitely one of my front row seats. So thank you all very, very much. We love you. Thank you.